No, we can't rely on offsetting. There is a lot of green wishing, green washing around, in particular planting trees, which is the number one offsetting uh, proposal today. Uh, everyone should know uh, from school that uh, trees, on one hand, consume greenhouse gas emissions, in particular uh, carbon dioxide, but in parallel, they also consume oxygen and emit greenhouse gas emissions. It takes, on average, something like 20 years until they start paying off. In 20 years, we have the year 2044, and that's too late. So here we are, ladies and gentlemen, for the inaugural session of the Sustainability Sessions by Linworks. And I, my name is Georgia Laybourne. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer here at Linworks. And we want to put a focus and a spotlight on sustainability within retail. Now, my first guest for this auspicious podcast series is an old colleague of mine, Serge Shamshula from Transforian. And he is my guru when it comes to all things sustainability, um, particularly when it comes to transportation. So today we've constructed a little bit of a chit chat around transportation tactics within retail and we plan to bring to life some of the hints and tricks, some of the hints and tricks that you can use to start being a little bit more sustainable in the way you manage trans transportation within your organization. So, Serge, welcome to the sustainability sessions. Can I ask you to introduce yourself to the crowd? Of course, uh, glad to do so. And first of all, happy to re meet you, uh, dear Georgia, um, and uh, very honored to be interviewed today. Uh, yeah, my name is Sergey. I'm. Uh, I've studied uh, business administration and national economics. Worked as an independent consultant, and uh, some 25 years back, uh, I did consultancy projects linked to logistics, and uh, it hooked me. Uh, <laughs> and um, in the meantime, uh, I'm head of ecosystems at Transburn, a Trimble company, which is kind of partnerships, but uh, uh, sustainability is a core competence of of mine. And that relates to what uh, our customers are struggling with uh, and uh, also to uh, the sustainability part of our own organization, Transborn, which is a member of the Science-Based Target Initiative, uh, by the way. I think that's pretty much enough on me today. It's a wonderful intro, and, and I can't share with the audience sufficiently how much of a spirit guide Serge has been uh, to my sustainability uh, journey since I met him two or three years ago. Um, so let's get into this, Serge, because I've got some really, really deep dive questions for you today. I'm very conscious that transportation plays an enormous role in retail. If you think about it, we've got to move goods from the manufacturer out into the market. And we haven't even mentioned getting the raw goods into the manufacturer in the first place. But then we've got to get the wholesale location to the retail location, potentially from the warehouse to the retail outlet, and then finally into the hands of the customer. So there's lots of moving parts. So perhaps you could start us off with some of the stats facts. I have a feeling they're going to be a little bit appalling about the impact transportation has on the environment, but can you share some of those high-level numbers with us? Uh, I can, and even though I don't want to flood you with too much uh, statistics, but we can, uh, we can say, uh, first of all, that uh, globally, logistics uh, accounts for somewhere between 10 and 12% of our total greenhouse gas emissions. For some guys, this might sound high. For others, this doesn't. Uh, actually, every percentage counts. Uh, and uh, uh, we need to, to touch that uh, uh, environmental aspect uh, uh, on every area. So 10 to 12% is pretty much significant. And uh, logistics has a higher uh, uh, the logistics has a higher uh, percentage in retail, as you say correctly. And that's uh, maybe the even bigger issue uh, or challenge, so to speak, that uh, the emissions related to retail uh, transportation are uh, steadily increasing. They are drastically increasing in, in, the, in the area of e-commerce. They are stable to still slightly increasing in uh, stationary retail so overall, the transportation uh, emissions in the uh, retail go into the wrong direction still. That's, uh, that's uh, the real pain here. And uh, we need to see how we can turn that around. 
obviously there are some opportunities to turn them around, but I trust we're going to touch them in a couple of minutes. Um, so I guess the good news is the only way is up or down, depending on which way you want to look at it in terms of reducing those carbon emissions. So there's clearly a lot that we can think about and do to improve upon this current situation. But where does one start? Because it's a little bit like the elephant in the room. You can't eat the whole elephant at once. So what are the initial steps a, a retailer can take to starting to chip away at that footprint? You're totally right. This is uh, an undertaking which isn't done in a day, uh, or probably not even within a year or very few years. Uh, as always in life, uh, you cannot manage uh, what you can measure. Another Austrian, I'm Austrian, uh, who uh, has been become famous uh, for saying so, uh, Mr. Drucker, Peter Drucker. Uh, and um, it's perfectly true also here. That means uh, the first uh, challenge is is to start the journey to get a real impression of your actual uh, greenhouse gas emission footprint from transportation. And uh, for most retailers, this is a so-called scope three emissions, which means uh, retailers which do not operate with their own fleet, uh, for them it's a third, always a third party or a third party serving a third party or a third party serving a third party serving a third party, which sounds that's strange, but uh, you have to imagine that some of the transportation is inbound transport. Still, it, it is part of, of the footprint of the retailer, but uh, it means that uh, some, some industries uh, producing fast-moving consumer goods are ordering a logistics service provider. The logistics service provider is ordering a subcontractor, and the subcontractor might be even ordering uh, a carrier to undertake the transportation. And uh, all this takes place uh, outside uh, the, the retailer's own scope, but it impacts the greenhouse gas emission of the retailer. And this is uh, most probably not the most complex example. It is more a simplified example. And you have already three different levels. So uh, long story short, uh, it's a journey. Uh, people who try to measure the scope three emissions from transportation, first of all, face a big problem in getting any kind of data. So what you start with is typically you do an estimation based on, 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 uh, on turnover or, or other indicators which you have available to some extent, on, on like by value or purchase price. And uh, this, is, this takes you actually nowhere. <laughs> you just have, have a number to report, but it has no value at all. Uh, and then, then you, you uh, try to get closer to the reality and that means that uh, you uh, move to base your assumptions, and it's, it's still assumptions, on industry default averages, uh, like uh, provided by the GLEC, the GLEC, the Global Logistics Environmental uh, Council. Uh, and uh, last but not least, you move uh, to pri use primary data, so the real data, uh, to measure your greenhouse gas emissions. And if you do all these steps, you will see that uh, on one hand, uh, uh, you, uh, your emissions typically get less. They should get less. There are maybe some exceptions where it is not so, but you get closer, of course, to the reality. And you get, you get the framework which allows you to do the next steps uh, later on. But uh, just one small detail. Um, it sounds complex. It is, it is a bit complex. And uh, you, as a retailer, you are well advised to do it in a scalable way. Uh, uh, very simple. Re remember those different parties which are in the room. Uh, if you try to connect to each of them, uh, you, you, are, you are done. You can't get any further because it, you're busy the entire year without getting a lot of information. So what you need to do you need to use scalable systems, like uh, like uh, we propose that you do it in a network where where there is a, a neutral body, uh, like a logistics platform, uh, which is connecting to the individual vehicles to get the primary data out of the vehicles, share them with the carrier. The carrier also has to measure its greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, the, uh, that's not obsolete. Uh, 
share it with the logistics service provider, share it with the shipper, and share it with the retailer. And all these parties together, they then, every party can extract those data which is relevant for them uh, and, and uh, shape their own strategies and optimization pathways individually. Okay, so to summarize that little bit of insight, it strikes me that for the audience, we've got um, two different uh, parties that we need to cater to. We've got those with their own fleet, where they need to be putting pressure on their transportation team, their logistics team, to get on top of their carbon footprint through these various measures. And for those without their own fleet who are using third-party resources, they need to be pretty discerning with regards to the partners they're working with. And from the sounds of it, Transporian is very akin, well, I know Transporian, <laughs> so who am I to say? But Transporian and Limworks are very, very much in synergy with regards to this concept of the platform and the real-time insights, the data sharing, the automation. All of this helps to reduce the footprint and connect you to the right people at the right time for the right reasons. So that's that's great insight. Um, thank you, Serge. Now, I want you now to dream a bit bigger because I know you're capable of it. And I want you to think about innovations that are in place that completely revolutionize the freight footprint. Tell us about some of the projects that you're getting involved in around this kind of like big, hairy, audacious innovation. Let me turn the question around a little bit and, and take it from, from uh, the, the industry side. Uh, our parent company, Trimble, uh, my company, Transburn, the CUNY Logistics University and uh, Smart Freight Center have uh, undertaken a survey most recently uh, uh, on uh, the pulse of the industry uh, on the pathway of greenhouse gas emissions. And one of the questions we've been asking was, uh, what are your top priorities uh, you are working on to decarbonize uh, your logistics operations? And the answer the top three priorities uh, uh, coming out of the survey were, first of all, modal shift, second, load and routing optimization, and third, carrier management, carrier optimization, so to speak. I would, uh, I think for retail, it also makes sense to talk a little bit about fleet electrification and uh, collaborative networks. Uh, so to start with modal shift, um, this might be, uh, for the entire industry, a uh, number one priority. Obviously, for retail, there is not so much in, uh, because retail transportation has a different pattern than the industry. Uh, mm -hmm. Transportation distances are shorter, uh, uh, consignments uh, are of smaller sizes, um, and that uh, indicates that modal shift is still an option for retail, but uh, probably the impact is not as big as, as for the industry. Uh, so moving transports uh, from road to rail, for example. Still, it is possible, I, I would say. And even on shorter distances, we have seen con concepts being quite well executed uh, in the UK, for example, in Switzerland, on distances like 100 kilometers, like, a, like a 80 miles uh, only. Uh, but this is maybe more an exception. Uh, what is interesting is load and routing optimization. And uh, I know a couple of retailers who have implemented kind of load and routing optimization uh, into their operations already in the past. And they said this helped us to save some 10 to 12 percent in parallel of cost of movements and of greenhouse gas emissions. Ha now comes the real however. This is not the end of the story. This is just the beginning of the story. We have been analyzing in Transboron uh, opportunities to go further in, in uh, load and routing optimization, in particular if you uh, use the different um, liberty you find in, in between the different actors in the supply chain. Uh, so it, sometimes a product does not have to be picked up on Monday 1600 sharp. Uh, you could combine it with other transports. <laughs> And uh, if we apply most modern load and routing optimization uh, strategies, we can increase significantly uh, uh, this amount of savings uh, up to 20% and more. I, was, I didn't believe these numbers until I have seen them myself. So there is really a lot in. And this is the great thing here is 
you you do not only surf the the environment, you also surf your own cost structure. Hard to understand if you don't go for that. To be frank, uh, also in a difficult uh, commercial environment. The 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 other aspect is carrier optimization, and uh, this is something you can you can do uh, on the strategic level uh, when you uh, plan your long term network. Uh, where do you place your hubs, your sites, etc.? But you can do that also on a pretty operational level from year to year. To because I made one exercise comparing conventional road transport companies operating with standard diesel trucks, so to speak. Huh? You would assume that well, there is not so much different between what the one and what the other is doing in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. You believe so until you have seen the reality and the real numbers. What I want to say, in long story short, is there's up to 100% difference uh, from from upside to the downside, of course. Uh, so there are significant differences. To give you a, one granular example only, road transport companies serving retail, which operates uh, uh, their trucks thanks to uh, driver, driver training and uh, fuel consumption monitoring, with 20% less uh, fuel, which has a major impact, of course, on the greenhouse gas emissions, compared to the average, not compared to any standard, compared to the average in the industry. So again, a cost-saving exercise, which is uh, in parallel serving serving the environment. Uh, and optimization, that means the pre-requirement is, again, to have primary data, as I said a few minutes ago, because if you don't have primary data or uh, service or, or uh, uh, logistic service providers operating on the same corridor have the same greenhouse gas emissions per definition. So there is nothing to, to be optimized. You can optimize only if you've got primary data in front of you. And as I said, uh, with regard to retail, uh, let's talk also about fleet electrification and uh, collaborative networks. Uh, fleet electrification is something which will take quite a while to to uh, come into into uh, effect. However, this is beautiful for retail in particular because all these relatively short distance movements are perfectly fit with fleet electrification. So this conversion of of uh, heavy duty vehicles uh, into electric vehicles is is uh, something uh, retail can pick up faster than the industry, which has to struggle with longer distances where this concept has a lot of, uh, yeah, I wouldn't call them shortcomings, but challenges. Uh, and uh, uh, as of in about two years from now, the first megawatt charging stations will be available for installation. And this is something to be considered, to have uh, megawatt charging stations installed close to the close or next to the docks and the yards of the retailers, uh, which would allow the service providers to charge the vehicles uh, before uh, or after after uh, after uh, loading or unloading the products at site. There is, of course, more to say on megawatt charging stations and charging methodologies, but this is, these are details which are not so decisive for today. But these are real opportunities which are in the favor of of, uh, of uh, retailers because they are sitting at the good place to to exercise such uh, such kind of approach. And finally, there's a lot in, in collaboration. Unfortunately, human beings are not that collaborative as we sometimes believe. That means uh, it 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 really requires a change in met mentality. But we have seen on on the level of single projects where. Uh, a large British uh, supplier of uh, empty pellets, for example, has been collaborating with a with a uh, with a, a fast-moving consumer goods company and the retail. On the other hand, you could see that you can optimize a lot, a lot, reducing empty mileage. Uh, empty miles, on average, is twenty percent in Europe, and in 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 UK retail, it's much more than this twenty percent. Savings which which save you both cost and and greenhouse gas emissions in parallel, but you need to do it in a network if you want to scale up. But the fascinating thing about what you're sharing here is, you know, I asked for big 
audacious, innovative change. And actually, all of this is really tangible. And yes, it's reaped in innovation. But, you know, when you think about the modal shift, there are simple decisions retailers can make about shifting their suppliers, shifting their means. You know, I I can see that really having an impact. The routing optimization is a no-brainer. I've seen that in my past from, you know, I remember this fantastic story in the US where, you know, they only turned right and they saved you know, many points on the cost of the the transport. Um, The carrier management is key. We talked about being more discerning as you chose the the suppliers that you were working with. Electrification is a big one. I mean, you know, on a personal level, I'd love to go electric, but I'm not convinced the infrastructure is there yet. I think it's better in in mainland Europe than it is here in the UK. But I think that's going to be huge as the years roll by. And the collaborative network, I mean, one retailer's return journey could be the primary journey for another retailer. So that's that's huge. Thank you. Thank you very much for that insight. Much appreciated. Now, I'm going to skip the topic of compliance because I fear we might end up having dinner together if we go down that road. Um, but what we'll do is we'll put some links in the podcast to some of the um, forthcoming pressures that are coming from a regulatory perspective so that reader, so that uh, listeners can read up on that. Spend two sentences only on that. Uh, first of all, it's highly uh, underestimated what is approaching. Uh, in, uh, in particular, in mainland Europe, we, you have the CSRD, the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive. We found uh, companies uh, uh, very, very uh, badly prepared for this. And the second thing I wanted to say is these regulations uh, bring one thing uh, on our table, which means an increasing cost pressure over time. So we need to tackle this. We need to take them serious because cost won't come tomorrow, but the day after tomorrow. We definitely do. And one of my reasons for skipping over that is not to um, marginalize it in any way, shape or form. But I have a feeling our audience is predominantly outsourcing their big freight challenges. And therefore, those pressures are going to be more incumbent on their suppliers than it is on them themselves. But I'm not marginalizing it. We will put a link in this podcast so that people can follow up. What I really want to move to, Serge, is a topic that is very sensitive because I know it's a little bit close to your heart. I want to talk about offsetting because so many people in in the marketing world, I'm going to kind of accuse my own um, my own sector here, are using offsetting as an alternative to actually getting to grip with their carbon footprint. So can you give us your view on whether we should focus on operational adjustments or whether offsetting is sufficient for our environmental goals? Your question allows me to simplify my answer, which is great in in terms of of the time spent. Uh, No, we can't rely on offsetting. Uh, To give you a simple example, um, so uh, there's a lot of green wishing, green washing around, in particular planting trees, which is the number one offsetting uh, proposal today. Uh, I think there was a lot uh, in the media on on how much uh, green wishing and green washing is is uh, uh, is behind this proposal. Uh, but just one simple thought: uh, you plant the tree, fine. You 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 are not one of those guys who are standing with a with a with a, a flame and say. I burn that tree, that that forest down. Except you give me a few euros, and then you give a, get a carbon credit certificate from me because I don't burn down my forest. This also happens even in the so-called gold standard, uh, which is one of the reasons why why I question that a lot. Uh, but let's assume you really plant a tree or several trees, uh, and then you you can turn you can turn your calendar forward because it will take twenty years until these trees uh, deliver a surplus of green, uh, greenhouse gas emission absorption. Uh, everyone should know uh, from school that uh, trees, on one hand, consume greenhouse gas emissions, in particular uh, carbon dioxide, but in parallel, they also consume oxygen and emit greenhouse gas emissions. And to and it takes, a, on average, uh, that is uh, individually tree by tree, a little bit different and by regionality, but it takes, on average, something like 20 years until you they, they start paying off. In 20 years, we have the year 2044. 
and that's too late. So I agree. I, I firmly agree with your sentiment here, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't do offsetting because just because it's going to take 20 years to have an impact doesn't mean we shouldn't do it because we know that the earth will be a richer place if we can reinvest in the tree population of our planet. So for me, it's a, it's a hybrid approach. You know, I want to see operational adjustments that are making absolute impact on our carbon footprint but I also like the concept of offsetting um, as icing on the cake. Let's call it that. To be honest, uh, as an immediate uh, reflex, um, until I know where I can do something or have these uh, 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 endeavors in place, I can understand and let's do something in that direction. But, uh, but, 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 now comes the but. Considering that we have limited money available, limited, uh, limited budgets for such undertakings, I would rather take such amount of money to uh, install uh, load optimization and routing strategies uh, where I even reduce my cost pattern instead of planting trees. And uh, as we talk about offsetting, no, I don't give you election, uh, a lecture on insetting. But don't forget that there is something like insetting available. I give you a simple uh, example I like very much. Uh, a, a company producing soft drinks uh, has started to uh, invest, uh, spend money uh, in, in uh, um, third parties who set up a refinery for uh, biogas. This biogas is available to the logistic service providers of that company and uh, is going to reduce uh, the greenhouse gas footprint of that company as well. And this is a kind of insetting. That means in insetting, you, have a, you, you, you invest the money directly into, into the logistics sector, which falls at the end of the day even into your own scope of emissions. Uh, which makes much more sense, which also takes uh, a couple of years to get uh, to get uh, such a refinery up and running, but it makes much more sense than just planting trees. But again, if you want to plant some trees, please do so. <laughs> so I love these kind of conversations, Serge, where I unexpectedly learned something that I didn't know before we spoke. So you have just educated me on insetting. So hopefully... I can spread that wealth further afield. Um, so thank you for that. Now I want to bring this. Um, I want to bring this down to you as an individual. So I want to take this away from freight, and I want to take this down to Serge's life day to day, and talk to you as a consumer. When you go out shopping, whether it's online or whether it's in a store, what are your must-haves when you embark upon a new purchase? Do you have specific things that you look out for before you? Um, decide to buy something from a particular retailer? Obviously, it depends on what kind of products I'm after. Uh, like, uh, if I think on food, in all fairness, uh, I, s I try to figure out the health impact of that food and uh, have a preference for, for buying organic food uh, by reflex. Uh, in that context, uh, trans the impact of transportation is very often even overestimated. Uh, and uh, can be quickly counterproductive. I give you a simple example, uh, which is perfectly applicable, uh, applicable also to to the UK market. For example, uh, imagine you uh, buy tomatoes or, or, or potatoes in win in particular in winter time. To buy organic potatoes from Egypt is still a valid proposal. This the, the impact of the transportation on the entire greenhouse gas footprint and on the entire, entire uh, sustainability uh, profile of those organic Egyptian potatoes uh, is so marginal that it is undercompensating uh, the, the, the impact of, of these kind of products where you need uh, greenhouses in the UK, greenhouses in, on, the, on the European continent to produce the same kind of products uh, during the same period of the year. Uh, and uh, these greenhouses uh, have a much bigger impact than this marginal transportation from Egypt to the UK or to somewhere in Europe. Uh, so uh, 
this has to be really looked uh, uh, at uh, from a more holistic uh, point than uh, the local producers would us would like us to think of. That is fascinating because I would buy British potatoes every day of the week, thinking that it's the right decision to make from a you know local um, in local economy from a transportation perspective. So I hadn't even thought of that, Serge. That's fascinating. Nothing wrong, to be clear. Nothing wrong to buy British potatoes. Please continue doing so. But in the in the good period of the year, and if you can buy the uh, organic ones, personally, this is would be my recommendation in, for a couple of good reasons, not only environmental reasons, but uh, as said, uh, you have to think, when do I buy tomatoes when do i buy potatoes what is the year is that the season to plant them locally or do do we emit a lot of greenhouse gases use a lot of chemicals etc just to compensate that we are in the wrong period of the year fascinating um so my next my penultimate question is around um shopping experiences that you've had in the past now strict rules here we're not going to name any names i don't want to name and shame any retailers but do you have a particularly fantastic shopping experience or a particularly dreadful shopping experience that you could share with the audience? Uh, probably too many experiences. <laughs> <laughs> to 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 point at at at, at, at this, yeah, and and to be honest, uh, this extent of uh, green washing and green wishing and uh, use uh, sometimes really advised to call it cheating. You find. Uh, uh, when when shopping is not limited to greenhouse gas emissions, it's rather it starts with health impact, with uh, animal rights and uh, social amp- uh, aspects of of the produce uh, you want to buy. And in all fairness, this is not uh, driven by the retailer. This is typically driven by the the producer of the consumer goods. And um, yeah, just uh, recently I had a a pack in front of me with great oranges on. So we all know that the price of orange juices have drastically increased. Uh, I'm not commenting deeper into that, even though I could. Uh, but it's uh, it's the market. So that was a nicely priced orange juice and it was, it was there was a big sign of 100% on it. So we would, by reflex, expect that this was uh, orange juice with 100% uh, orange juice inside. This was not so. However, the producer, a well-recognized brand name in Europe, by the way, uh, made uh, an endeavor to hide what was really in, because it was a light yellow packing, and then it was in a in a in letters which were not sharply printed. It was written what the ingredients were written in white on this light yellow. So white and light yellow, that's not a very good contrast. To be honest, I was I had to remove my eyeglasses, get into the right uh, into the right place with the right li- right uh, light to look at until I was able to read it. It was not easy. When I was reading what was inside, it was maybe 40% orange juice and the rest was water, sugar and some other chemical ingredients. And the impression it gave was completely the opposite. I have put it back into the stack, as you can imagine. Uh, 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 greenhouse gas emissions are not are not the priority to, for cheating in, in retail still, but that might come over time. But in general, uh, people are well advised to spend maybe a few seconds in reading and reflect what they read, if they can read it, which sometimes, as we see, can be even a challenge. So this speaks very much to honesty, transparency, good labeling, good packaging, and not trying to hide things from us. don't trust labels which uh, the producer has invented. Absolutely. Okay, um, so finally, and this is the question of the hour, I'm going to ask this of all of my guests over the course of time. From your perspective, what is the right balance between cost control, customer service, and the environment when it comes to a retailer's commerce operations? 
we have to look at what is the profile and the strategy of the individual retailer. And then you obviously and fortunately, there are more than one successful strategies out there. So there are valid proposals and you always have to see uh, what kind of profile you want to serve and what kind of combination would fly. For example, it's obvious that uh, uh, a relatively high cost uh, combined with a low customer service and a poor sustainability a strategy should not go hand in hand. That's not a very successful proposal. Uh, but also compensating poor customer service with a nice sustainable uh, proposal uh, won't be forgiven by the consumer as well. So you really have to see where is my niche, what is my profile, so how can I combine that? But what we, what we can say in, in general, obviously, cost control in itself is compulsory. Uh, if, if, you, if, it, if a retailer has no proper cost control, uh, yeah, I think uh, the retailer would very quickly become obsolete. Uh, and, but cost control does not necessarily mean, and that's uh, uh, easy to say, uh, the lowest uh, possible cost. Absolutely. It's a tricky one. I think we're going to have some interesting answers to that question over the course of time. Serge, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on this inaugural session. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, and I wish you all the best. And thank you. Hey, Georgia, the pleasure was on my side and very much looking forward to re-meet with you. And uh, good luck with your exercise. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you all for listening. <laughs>